Well, hey, I'm excited uh, to be here this morning, and I'm excited we're kind of coming to a conclusion of this series that we've been in, in called The God I Never Knew. And I want to ask you a question as we start out this morning, and the question is this, have you ever had a time in your life where you felt absolutely powerless? powerless. I can remember for myself uh, when we had Brett sitting back there. He always loves when I use him as the example. He actually hates it. (laughs) But when we had Brett, uh, we uh, had him in the hospital, Houston, uh, Texas Women's Hospital, and uh, we had to take a trip pretty quickly uh, out to LA. There was like a conference going on, And so uh, April and I and Brett, we went out. Brett was like under six months old. And he got really, really sick when we were out in Los Angeles. And I remember uh, it got to kind of a critical point. He had this super high fever. April thought he had pneumonia. And we had to take him to this hospital in Los Angeles that we were not familiar with at all. And I'll never forget walking in and the nurses took, took him and they went behind these two doors. <laughs> and I walked and I said, can I go back there? And they said, no, you can't go back there. You have to stay out here. And I remember thinking, like feeling so powerless. Like here's my, my son who is like sick and he's crying and he's got this high pitched cry. And, and here I am in an unfamiliar city and with people that I don't know. And, and not only that, I can't go. And they didn't even have cameras. And I can't go back with them. And I just remember feeling powerless. Powerless. One of the more famous advertising campaigns in the history of advertising. And when I say it here in a minute, you're, you're going to get it. Um, It actually started out with an Italian-American guy who had moved uh, to Brooklyn, New York when he was 11 years old. And he uh, was really, really, really small. His name was uh, Angelo uh, Sciano. He was Italian. And he... Fame has it said that he went to a beach one day, and on that beach, a buff guy came and kicked sand into his face, and his girlfriend got up and left and walked away, and he left that place and went and committed himself to getting power and getting in the weight room. And his name, he changed his name at 30 years of age to Charles Atlas. And his 97-pound weakling advertisement has been used all over the world. It's been in literature and magazines and music and even video games. And so this is the picture of one of the typical ads that has come out throughout history. Hey, skinny, your ribs are showing. And it just shows this story of him getting hit and then him going in and getting power and strong and then him coming back and taking care of business. And then as he took care of business, here comes his girlfriend back to him. Because here's, and so here's a picture of actual, the actual Charles Atlas, right there. See, here's the reality, is that every single one of us needs power. Every single one of us. It's just where do we look for the power? Because we need power to go through this life. And our, we're going to start in the Word today, and we're going to pick it up in Luke chapter 24. 
And Luke chapter 24 is a really important passage of scripture. You, you'll see it here. Brett will put it up on the, uh, on the board for us, the screen. So Luke 24 is this important passage in time of scripture because like a lot has already happened. Like Jesus has been born, Jesus has grown up, Jesus has been revealed at the Jordan, Jesus has done his three and a half years of ministry, Jesus has been come into the city, Hosanna, Hosanna, palm branches, Jesus has been crucified, Jesus has been buried, and now Jesus has resurrected, and he's about ready to leave and ascend and go back to heaven. And he appears to his disciples, and we're going to pick it up here in verse 36. And it says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and feet, and while they still not be- did not believe it, be- uh, Because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He said, hey, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled, what is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they they could understand the scriptures. And he says, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He tells them, essentially, like, don't even begin to go and try to do ministry and try to follow me without this power that I'm going to give you. Now, here's the thing that we have, to, we have to get our hands around at this point. It's we have to understand the context in which they were actually living. Because they were shell-shocked at this particular point in time. I mean, here they had been following Jesus for three and a half years, and things were good. I mean, there are miracles and people are being raised from the dead and all you can eat fish fries. And I mean, it's, it's, it was good. And then all of a sudden, all their hopes are dashed. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you and I were living and we had like a big brother and our big brother was all that in a bag of chips and he was tough. And somebody, a bully, comes into our neighborhood. And we're like, yeah, big brother's going to go get him. And big brother walks out there and gets it handed to him. And we're like back on our heels like, okay, like, like you're calling me to go into that same arena and that same culture Like, I don't know if I want to do it. I've seen how you got treated, Jesus. I've seen what they did to you. They're, 
man, they're, they're apprehensive. They're shell-shocked. They're on their heels. They're not as, I mean, they were bold a week ago. Now they're, they're pretty uncertain. So you have to understand where they were, but then you have to understand where he was calling them to go. And he's essentially saying to, to them, like, look, like I'm going to send you out and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But here's the thing you have to realize. He says, I'm going to be sending you out into a culture that absolutely does not understand you, nor do they embrace you. I'm going to be sending you out literally like sheep among wolves. Just understand it. This is not going to be easy. Okay? They're going to persecute you. They're going to reject you. Okay, just understand it. Then he's saying, not only am I sending you out into a culture that is not going to understand you or embrace you and reject you and persecute you, but I'm sending you out into a battlefield where you have an enemy who wants to destroy your life. Just understand, that's what I'm sending you out into. And he says, but I'm going to give you power. Power. Every one of us needs power. What kind of power? What kind of power am I talking about? Well, first, it's the power to be a bold witness or to live courageously. He says, he's gonna, the Holy Spirit is gonna allow us, we're gonna look at this in a minute, is gonna allow us to be a bold witness. Now, let me give you a biblical example, and then I'm gonna give you a personal example. The biblical example is Peter. Peter, in the last days before Jesus was crucified, was confident and sure. I mean, he's the one that's like, Jesus, everybody else is going to deny you? Not me. Nope. Like, no. Like, all these other guys, they're going to deny you? Uh-uh. It ain't going to be me. And Jesus is, looks at him and says, like, Peter, you don't even understand. Before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. Why? Why? Because Peter had not yet learned that you don't fight this battle in the flesh. See, he was like, no, I'm confident in my flesh. I'm confident in my will. I'm confident in my own ability. And Jesus is like, you don't understand. The arena that you're getting ready to walk into, the flesh means nothing. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not. It's against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Our battle is not against flesh. And Peter's sitting there. And Jesus is like, dude, if you could see and understand what I see and understand, you would be approaching this different. But, so Peter fails. And Peter, and we've all failed. Who here has failed? Come on, every single day, fail. And Peter fails, and he doesn't know what to do with his failure. And Jesus comes back, and Jesus restores him in John 21 and says, Hey, man, I still got a purpose for you. Hey, man, I still got ministry for you. I know that you betrayed me and denied me, but I still got future for you and purpose for you. And here's what happens is that we're going to see here in a minute, Peter, this person, 
who, when the pressure came, he folded, is the same Peter that in Acts 2 is going to stand up on the day of Pentecost and boldly preach the gospel so boldly that 3,000 people get saved. What transformed between Peter denying and Peter standing was the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit operating in his life. So one of the first things that the Holy Spirit allows us to do is to be a bold witness. A man said years ago, he said, the world is never moved by the mildly interested. Think about it. What moves you? Passion. Passion is what moves all of us. Courage is what moves us. Now listen, here's the thing. We see the biblical example, but I can tell you one of the hardest things to do in this life is to actually share the gospel. Everything in my flesh does not want to do it. It's awkward. It's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. And that's even just sharing it with my wife. <laughs> like, seriously, there will be times when I'm, I'm in a place and I, I'll feel like the Lord will say, hey man, go share my love with this person. Go. And I'm like, and I start psyching myself out, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, this is going to go bad and all these things are going to blah, blah. And, but here's the thing. The Holy Spirit, when we yield ourselves to him, he gives us boldness. Boldness to, to, to go through the discomfort, to go through the inconvenience, to, to be a bold witness. Here's the thing that I can tell you. I was very reluctant as an early believer. And I'm not saying this, just, I mean, this was not planned in my sermon. But when I got out of playing for the Rockets, my confidence was shattered. I was a believer, but I had no confidence. I mean, and I, I mean, I loved God. I went to church and I got an opportunity to meet this man right here. And we were in the same small group in Houston, Texas, and he had a ministry called Commandos. And he would go into prisons and he would go into schools and he would go into university camp. He would go into parks and do feats of strength and do out. So he asked me one time, he said, hey man, why don't you come with me? I'm going to go into uh, Huntsville prison. And um, I'm like, oh man, I don't want to do that. It's a Saturday. Like, how long is this thing going to take, man? He's like, well, bro, we leave at about seven in the morning. We get in there, we set up do the show, pray, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, all right, man, I'll go. I'm like, dude, is it going to be safe? Like, are these, is this like maximum security or what's the deal here? And he's like, no, bro, there's a little bit of a risk, but it's pretty safe. So we go in and he asked me to get up and just share a little testimony. I'm like, oh, man. So I shared a little testimony. He does the feature, he preaches the gospel. And like 150 men, prisoners, come forward with tears in their eyes, asking Jesus to come, come into their life. And I remember thinking, the reward is so much better than the fear and the apprehension and the indecision. It's like if we would have just allowed our, our fear and discomfort from stepping into that. Maybe none of this ever happened. And I was sharing with him last night. He was over 
he, he, at one point in time, he was in about 220 schools a year in about how many prisons? About 85 prisons a year, going in and preaching the gospel. And I told him, I said, Billy, God used you at a point in my life when I needed to see somebody who lived out the gospel courageously. Like, a lot of times more things are caught than taught. Like, I would go, and I'm like, okay, like, I think I'm catching this. This love and this boldness to share the gospel, not obnoxiously, but, but sharing it. Because God has chosen the instrument for the salvation of people to actually come through you and I sharing the gospel. That's what it says in Romans How will they know unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone tells them? Oh, how blessed are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace. How how did I get saved? Because a teammate of mine in Houston, Texas, David Wood, the first day in the locker room of training camp, I walked in, we were doing arm bell curls, and I said, hey man, what's up? And he goes, hey man, do you believe in Jesus? I'm like, well, yeah, of course. Jesus is a good dude. Everybody believes in Jesus, right? He's like, awesome, man. Dap me with his forearm, you know, and I'm thinking like, wow. Like, at the end of that year, he grabbed me and he said, let's go to dinner. We sat down in Houston on off 59 and he said, I've been watching you this year. I think you know about Jesus. I don't think you have a relationship with him. I've been watching you. And I said, dude, you're right. And he goes, let's meet. I'm going to bring a pastor friend of mine and let's meet on Saturday. And him and his pastor friend led me to Christ. April got saved because her friend, Sue Spencer, at Viking Office Product, put her on her top 10 list and prayed for her for six months, invited her to church. April went. She freaked out. She avoided Sue Spencer for a few months, went to HR and said, she's persecuting me. She's inviting me to church. I want to get her fired. She developed all new routes how to get to her office so she didn't have to go by Sue Spencer's office. And then Sue Spencer invited her one more time and she went and she tells the story. She's sitting there in her Bob Marley t-shirt with her black high top speckled tennis shoes and her big hair, as we used to call it. It's short now. And she said, he got done preaching, Pastor Zach Nazarian, he got done preaching. And she said, I ran to the front. And he must have been thinking, wow, we got one on the hook. (laughs) We got a big fish. And she just said, I want Jesus. Sue Spencer. They say it's something like 97% of people come to Christ through a relationship. Through a relationship. And Jesus is saying, like, look, I know It's going to be tough out there. You're going into a culture that that doesn't understand you, that doesn't embrace you, that wants to resist you. You're going into an arena where you have an enemy who wants to resist you and, and take you down and will do anything he can to take you down. That's why you need my power. You can't do this on your own strength. He's a supernatural being. He lives in a spirit world. He destroys us in this arena. Jesus, man. So he says, like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you be a bold witness. Here's the thing. What if there is a power available to us? that would help us overcome fear, that would help us overcome anxiety, that would help us overcome depression, that would help us overcome temptation, that would help us overcome circumstances or not 
necessarily that the circumstances go away, but in the midst of the circumstances, we have something, someone living inside of us. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that's in me that's in the world. What if we had the ability to have something stronger on the inside of us than what's coming at us from the outside? And Jesus says, it is available. It's available. The word power that he uses there is the word dunamos, which is where we get our word dynamite. He says, I'm going to give you dynamite power when my Holy Spirit comes on you. Now look at this. I'm going to speed up. So in Acts, so Jesus tells them in Luke 24, he says, hey, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. The promise. The Holy Spirit. So they obeyed him. They go back to Jerusalem. They're waiting. They're waiting in the upper room. And here in Acts, we pick it up. And Acts is the continuation of the book of Luke because Luke wrote Luke and Acts because at the beginning of the book of, Luke, of Acts, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. Acts is the continuation of the book of Luke. So he writes Luke and now he's saying, okay, now I'm going to pick it up. And we pick it up, and here's what it says. After his suffering, the Christ showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. There it is. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Two baptisms. Actually, three. Baptism into Christ, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. What is baptism in the Holy Spirit? The word baptism comes from the word baptizo, which means to immerse, soak. It's literally in the old times they would actually say, use it in this way. The, um, the store owner baptized his pickles in vinegar. He soaked them. He immersed them. So the word baptizo is, is where we get this word baptism, which means to be immersed, soaked in power. Now look at what, it, what happens. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Meaning, hey man, is this it? Is this the deal? He said, hey, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power, dunamos, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Turn with me now. So Jesus talks about it in Luke 24. Luke picks it up and says, here's what Jesus said to him. They're waiting in the upper room and for the first time in history, the Holy Spirit is poured out on people. Now listen, this is important. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come on people, but it would come off people. The Spirit of God came on Saul and he began to prophesy. The Spirit of God would come on different people. He didn't indwell or reside in people. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, now for the first time ever, is going to come and actually indwell us permanently. The same Holy Spirit in Genesis 1 that was creating the earth, 
The same Holy Spirit that came on David, the same Holy Spirit that came on, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that's available to every believer. Now watch this. The day of Pentecost came, Acts 2.1, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a rushing, violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They, the disciples, saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The Holy Spirit, everything that was prophesied about in the Old Testament in Joel, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit, capital S, on all flesh. Your son, right? This is it. This is the fulfillment. And so they're in Jerusalem and there's all these different types of people there. And Peter stands up and Peter starts boldly preaching. He preaches from verse 14 all the way over. We're going to look here in a minute. And he's going back through Israel's history and he's going back through the prophecies. He says, listen, because the people that were there are like, y'all are drunk. And Peter's like, nah, dude, it's nine in the morning. We ain't drunk. This is what was prophesied by Joel. And he goes and he comes over to this turning point in verse 36. And he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, the one you just saw and heard that was crucified, buried, resurrected, not another Jesus, not Muhammad, not Krishna, not the Jesus to come, not Mormon Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's made both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard it, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Key verse here, 39. The promise is for you, all your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. People will tell you. They'll go, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit was just for them because they needed it in that, that time. Like, we don't need it today. Like, eh, this was a special time. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this promise is for you, your children, for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Has God called you, Jay? You're all. Has God called you, Lori? You're all. Has God called you, Stephanie? You're all. All. The Holy Spirit. Now listen, here's the thing. The gospel from this point on explodes. Explodes. Why? Because it's supernatural. It's supernatural. Let me end with this. Let me just say this. Jesus promised his followers and us power. We were never supposed to go through the Christian life in our own strength. Never. I want to focus on one thing and we're going to be done. I talked about this earlier. What kind of power? What kind of power is, is the Bible talking about? Power to be a bold witness? Yes. Power over sin? Yes. 
power in prayer. Romans 8 says, we do not know how to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses because he, the Spirit knows the mind and will of God. I don't know about you, when I, before I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, when I tried to pray, I mean, I would sit down and I'd put my head down and fall asleep for five minutes and then kind of come to and like the disciples in the garden. (laughs) And then I'd be like, yeah, Lord, uh, pray, just, just keep me healthy. Keep April healthy. Keep the kids healthy. All right, we're good. (laughs) The Holy Spirit, like, he helps you pray. And he'll be like, all of a sudden, he'll be like, hey, now, pray for this. Show you that, like, He helps us in our weakness because we don't know how to pray for as we ought. It's power to be a bold witness, power over sin, power in prayer, power over temptation, power in the midst of circumstances. Here's what I want to, last one. Power over spiritual forces that come against you. Listen, I don't have time today When you go through the book of Acts, you will see at every juncture, Paul is facing spiritual forces. He says at one point, hey man, if I've battled with the beasts at Ephesus, he's talking about demonic things. So in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, when Paul's writing to the Corinthians and he says, for our, our warfare, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, earthly, but they are mighty in God for the demolishing of strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He said, the weapons of our warfare, weapons, are not carnal. They're what? Mighty in God for the demolishing of strongholds. Listen, There are spiritual forces that are out there that want to come. Look, I'm a huge believer in psychology and science and all that. I would never dismiss any of that stuff, but let's not completely dis... Look, a lot of times I'm sitting there, a couple years ago, I'm sitting there, all of a sudden I was like, why am I so depressed? I just feel like this depression coming on me and oppression. And I'm like getting all these crazy thoughts and fears and anxieties. And all of a sudden one day, it's like the Holy Spirit goes, bro, like it's warfare. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay, what do I need to do? And it's like pray in the spirit, right? Right? And I started praying in the spirit. And it's all of a sudden, it's like all of a sudden, the the, the depression and the heaviness. I'm telling you, this stuff is real. All of a sudden, a few years ago, I'm going along and all of a sudden, a thought comes into my brain of like, yeah, man, you should just cash this whole thing in. Like, just do, just like disappear. Like the dude who went to the Appalachian Mountains the governor, whatever, like just take off to Argentina and leave your family. And I'm like, dude, where did that come from? Oh, I got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There, listen, the Holy Spirit, yes, allows us to be a bold witness. Yes, allows us to live in victory over sin. He helps us in temptation. He helps us in circumstances. He helps us, right? But he also helps us against the spiritual forces that come against our lives. And I'll end with this, man. 
And I know this isn't going to resonate with most people here. Some of you it will. But about three months ago, um, Brett and Trey were like, hey, man, we want to go see this new Spielberg movie that's coming out, Ready Player One. And I'm like, okay, I like Spielberg. Let's go see it. So we're watching this movie. And this young man, he's kind of living in this virtual world, right? Because he doesn't want to live in the real world. Because the real world is problematic and nasty and he's poor and he's living in the, you know, and he's like, so they, everybody at this point in time in the future are living in virtual reality because in virtual reality, you can be anybody you want. Like in virtual reality, dude, I'm LeBron. I'm 6'8", 245 with a 40 inch vertical. At Gold's Gym, I'm not. I'm a 51 year old dude that can't touch the rim. But they're living in virtual reality. And all of a sudden, though, there's some things that are happening in the real world that he's going to have to come back into the real world and live between these two worlds. And he's going to have to fight in the real world. And so he's got this girl that he meets in who's also in virtual reality, doesn't know who she is in real life. But her character in virtual is really cool, hip. And they meet, but all of a sudden, these enemies come to destroy him. And she's like, here, use the weapons and the tools that, like, because they got, they won, he won this Donkey Kong race. So because of that, he got like 100,000 chips so he could like power up. Right? He's got like all these power-ups. And she's like, use the power-ups. And so they, boom, he uses this power-up and they go back in time. It sets things back where then they can react because earlier all these enemies had got on them right away. And they were about to get killed. So they use the power up. Boom, they go back and they're like, okay, they're about 30 seconds away. Let's go. Let's get out of here. But she's like, like, you got the power-ups. Don't just leave them in your pocket. And so many times as Christians, we're like, yeah, God, I want to collect all the power-ups, but I just want to have them on my belt. And he's like, no, dude, use the power-ups. Use the tools that I've, I've given you. Use them. Now listen, we're going to continue this next week and we're going to finish this series because we covered a lot of ground today. I know I, was, I, I wasn't very passionate today. I apologize. I'm a little tired. <laughs> listen, what does Austin need? Three and a half years ago, I wrote to Donnie Mabe and Tammy Overhauser and Chad Overhauser. And I wrote to Willie and Stephanie Hendricks. And I, I said, hey, guys, what? I'm trying to learn the Austin context. What does Austin need? And Willie Hendricks wrote me back a paragraph about this long. He says, Austin doesn't need more religion. They need an authentic move of God. They don't need more just flyers stuck in, you know, come to my church, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's great. They need, it, this needs a move of God. What changed the world in Acts 2 was the power of the Holy Spirit coming on people, them yielding themselves to him, and a movement starting that changed the world. That's what I want here. I don't want to just have a religious church. We're going to pick it up next week. No final song. Is that all right? Because I went like 85 minutes long. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for every single person that's here. God, um, God, you said in your word, this promise is for you and your children and for all. There's no second class citizens in the kingdom of God. The the power of God is available to every single one of us, God. 
But many times we, we just put it in our pocket or we don't recognize you or we're reluctant to actually step in to that. Lord, I just pray, God, just pour out your Holy Spirit. Let us not be embarrassed of you. God, let us be yielded to you. Use us for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I hope you guys have a great week. If you have any questions about the message I just gave, just call me or email me. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.